hearts and bless you and praise you. Lord, my heart cries out glory to the king. Who feels like glory this morning? That's what we've just sung. My heart cries out glory to the king. When did we last shout glory? Hallelujah. Ah, Father, sometimes we're singing uh, hymns that are not necessarily, uh, maybe partially our experience, but not fully our experience. Because if it was fully our experience, we'd be shouting glory. Glory, hallelujah. Oh, we thank you. Just pray for the, the bless the word of God. Pray for something of the unction of God to be upon myself as I bring the word of God and share it with God's people and any unconverted to me. Listen just now or listen later. Pray for the unction to be upon myself here and upon uh, God's people as they listen. And these things we ask in your name and for your sake. Amen. Enough cable here to hang myself. Just before, just before I start preaching, uh, maybe you wonder from time to time, the, the three books, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, you say, now, if all this is coming back, well, Esther is in Babylon, but uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, is all coming back from, coming back from Babylon, and the prophets, if you read through Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll notice the prophets who are mentioned are the prophets at the end of the Old Testament. There's Haggai, Zechariah, and then there's Malachi. And you say to yourself, how did all these books, why is these books are for the final part of the Old Testament chronology? Uh, chronology? Why are they where they are? Well, it's, you see, my friend, it's, the Bible wasn't written like that. Uh, if I had my Hebrew Old Testament uh, uh, and opened it this morning, how does the Old Testament finish in Hebrew? Ezra, Nehemiah, First Chronicles, and Second Chronicles. Now that's how the Old Testament finishes. Ezra, Nehemiah, First Chronicles, and Second Chronicles. So, uh, and then sometime later, of course, in English, in different versions, uh, the Old Testament, which originally had uh, 22 books, is, it was expanded to, uh, as well. Now, having said that, having, having said that, we're looking at the subject of the primary function of priesthood, and I think we'll look at uh, verse 10 of Ezra 7, uh, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach Israel statutes and judgments. Read that again. For Ezra had prepared his heart. Now, today we're looking at a priesthood in regards to sanctification. And we know in a, in a general way we think of sanctification, we think of holiness, of course. But we know here that Ezra had set himself apart, sanctified himself to what? Uh, to seeking the law of the Lord and, my friend, doing it and to teach Israel uh, statutes and judgments. And so I'd like to date for the time that I have to uh, look at the centrality uh, of the word of God, but could we just go back to our verse in, in Exodus uh, chapter 28, Exodus 28, and thou shalt put them upon, that's verse 41, Exodus 28, 41, and thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shall anoint them and consecrate them, so, and sanctify them, so we've been looking at anoint, the anointed priest, consecrated priest, and, and the sanctified priest. And then just, just before I, I, I move on, could we go back to just numbers for a moment? 
numbers where we were last week, numbers 26, numbers 25, numbers 25, and we looked at Phineas, and we looked at verse 11. Phineas, that's numbers 25 and verse 11. Phineas, the son of Eliza, the son of Aaron the priest, I turned my wrath away from the children of Israel. Well, he was zealous for my sake among them, or it uh, can be translated as being uh, sharing my zeal, sharing my zeal that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. In other words, my friend, before we move on, just let me say, Phineas uh, stood in the gap. And we, or we know our verses that sometimes use Ezekiel 22. I looked for someone to stand in the gap and I didn't find any. Uh, and sometimes I think, sometimes I think if we really read that verse, Phineas, the son of Elisa, the son of Aaron, had turned my wrath away from the children of Israel. Well, he was zealous. My friend, I think there's not even thinking back just one generation. There used to be times of prayer held in churches for, for revival and, and, and asking God to in wrath remember mercy. Sometimes in houses, there's very little of that left. There's very, very, very little. Friday nights, uh, they weren't exclusively used, but the, the, sometimes they were used for all nights of prayer. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, my friend, uh, because a lot of people weren't working on, on, on a Saturday. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think, do you think really we take in both that? You see, when we read over in Ezra, not only did he study the word of God, he put it into practice. And, uh, uh, and when we read that, it's turned my wrath up. I mean, would you agree with me, my friend, that this nation of ours, this nation of ours, and even wider in the world, my friend has been bringing the wrath of God upon it. And I was just thinking, thinking this morning that although we've been praying for revival for over 50 years, as long as the church has been, uh, and we haven't seen revival, but I wonder when we are praying in a Friday night over these 50 years. Now, I can't give you tangible proof right now, my friend, but I wonder how many, how, how did our prayers, has our prayers over 50 years restrained the hand of God in judgment over the nation? Now, we haven't saw revival. No, we haven't saw revival. But I wonder. I wonder, my friend, in all the prayers times over the 50 odd years, as we pray for revival, we're praying that God will in wrath remember mercy. But I wonder, I wonder, has our, has our prayers been restraining the hand of God? Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll not know that till we get to heaven. But it's, a, 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 it's worth a thought, my friend. It's, it's worth a thought because. Uh, here, here is just one man who turned the wrath uh, of God away uh, towards the children of Israel. So I thought that was I thought that was worth uh, mentioning. Uh, and just uh, for a, a, a matter two, if we turn over to uh, Ezra chapter nine, you'll see that Ezra. You see, although we've been looking at that text where we've got the three things, the anointing, the consecration, and the sanctification, they all overlap, my friend. They, they overlap. They overlap because uh, the, the, the people that are used, even King David, uh, I remember in one of the sermons about David dancing before the ark with the ephod, these were anointed by God. There was something I meant to mention weeks ago, and it went right out of my head, it's this. Did you know that David was the first male 
person to dance in the Bible. Did you know that? All the previous dancing was done by sisters. There were sisters dancing with, uh, with David, but going away back to Moses' time, uh, there was uh, Miriam who led dancing. David was the first male in the Old Testament to dance before the Lord. And so although we're looking at the three things, uh, uh, the three, three main points of that text, they all overlap. And you'll notice in Ezra chapter 9, uh, Ezra was a man, you can see he was a man after God's own heart and a man after uh, Phineas' heart. And that's uh, Ezra 9 in verse 5. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, Oh my God, I'm ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses grown up into the heavens. Now, the reason why I looked over into Nehemiah was to show you that Ezra did actually see a great reformation in the nation. But the man, the man, my friend, who led that reformation was a broken man and a humble man. And you can see that brokenness in him. And, and then when you turn over to Nehemiah, we're not dealing with Nehemiah. Nehemiah had, had a brokenness. Nehemiah uh, had a brokenness. We we'll look at some of the great intercessors. Daniel was a great intercessor. And Daniel uh, interceded and, uh, and identified just like, just like Ezra. Now, Ezra wasn't perfect, but from what we can see, I don't think he made any kind of make mistakes or put a foot wrong. But uh, no, th this was. Uh, and this is a man who led the people. Coming back to just over the first six chapters, just to fill you in, the reason why the first six chapters of Ezra doesn't mention Ezra at all. The first six chapters of Ezra was the first move from Babylon to first move from Babylon back to back to Jerusalem, and that was uh, a man called Zerubbabel who led that. And he took about 50,000 with him, 50,000 traveled with him. A good number of years passed, and then we come to Ezra chapter 7. Ezra now, how many came with Ezra? About 5,000. And you see, my friend, it's when you realize, that's why we come to the books of, of Esther. There was Jews all over the place, and in, in, in Babylon and all over. Why? They never came back. These were the... The Jews had, a had an opportunity with Zerubbabel and 50,000 came back. The Jews had an opportunity, and even with the approval of Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes, king of Persia, 5,000 just came back. Why? Because it was a good life in Babylon. That's why. Good life in Babylon. Good life. And that's why it was... It's going to be a hazardous journey to start with to go from Babylon to Jerusalem. And when we get there, we weren't going to have a picnic, we're going to do some hard work. Temple had to be rebuilt, the walls had to be rebuilt. But my friend, the people who came, uh, came with Ezra had a, had a mind, obviously, uh, to, to work. Uh, and uh, that's a beautiful thing. Suppose we ask the question again, what are the two main duties of priests? You say, well, offering sacrifices is one. Yeah. Let's turn over to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. And verse 1. Malachi chapter 2. And, yes, and now all you priests, this commandment is for you. So this is Malachi addressing the, the priests. And down to verse down to verse 6. The law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity. 
and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the Lord his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. The priests are the messengers, my friend. For the priests, but and it's a but, but ye have departed out of the way. You've caused many to stumble at the law. You've corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord. And that was the situation in Malachi's day. And they, so that shows you what priesthood was all about. They were the messengers. And over in chapter 1, over in chapter 1 and verse 6, to do with the other aspect of priesthood. A son honoreth his father, servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you? O priests that despise my name. And you say, but I never despise your name. You offer polluted bread upon mine altar. So just, just at the back of where we are chronologically is Malachi. Uh, and again, failed priesthood, offering anything up to God, anything, anything, and uh, turning people, and that was probably the biggest, the biggest sin of all, turning people away from the Lord. Well, my friend, I think it was Spurgeon that said, I, I wouldn't like to stand in the shoes of a minister who has told his congregation there's no hell. I would like to stand in their shoes in the day of judgment when they may very well meet members of the church, the very church. And, and we've all been at that. We've all been at funerals and everybody. One of the funerals that I, I stole, just whack me, this one. A young lady up the stair, married girl up the stair, died and a uh, Roman Catholic, and uh, I didn't, we didn't go to the mass for obvious reasons, but went to Philip's Hill, uh, 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 and uh, the priest who was taking the graveside said, it's good, now where he came from, don't ask me. But he said, this is what he said, it's good to know that the soul of our, <laughs> of our sister is with the Lord. And I said to myself, where on earth did he come from with that? My friend, according to the Roman Catholic Church, not even the Pope can be assured, nobody can be assured of that. Via purgatory. That's, that's, what, he, he, that's what he said. That, that's what he said. No, no, my friend, there's only one way of salvation, and that is the, the way of the cross. And, and then this is a beautiful thing about priesthood. In Ezra, Ezra, my friend, shared, Ezra shared the word of God. I, I think it's when we look at verse 6 of chapter 7, this Ezra went up from Babylon. He was already scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his, according to the hand of the Lord, his God upon him. And that's why, my friend, when Ezra left Babylon, the word of God tells us he came to Jerusalem in verse 9. What does that show us? If God's in something, and God starts something, he'll finish it, my friend. If God's in it, and God was in it, uh, and the king, that's verse 6, the king granted him according to the hand of the Lord. And you'll notice again in verse 9, came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Yeah? Upon him, for Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. My friend, did you seek, you prepare your heart to hear the word of God this morning? Because I'm preaching. Not because I'm preaching at all. Did you prepare your heart to hear the word of God proclaimed? Will you prepare your heart for later in the day, tonight, when our elder John brings the word of God. You should, we should. Speaking to the Holy Spirit, my friend. Uh, 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 and th this, is, this is a beautiful thing. You know, you know the anointing of God was on Ezra. The very fact that seeing the hand of God was upon him. 
hand. The beautiful thing is when the hand of God, when the hand of God is on someone, they'll find favour with God and favour with man. And that's why Ezra here finds favour with, with the king. And that's why, I don't have time to go all into this, but uh, from verse 11, Artaxerxes, now this is a copy of the letter that the king Artus gave unto Ezra. What a beautiful letter he wrote. Yeah. I, and right down to verse 26. And you'll notice, you'll notice uh, what Ezra, uh, how he finishes it. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which had put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Eh? And coming right, and I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord, my God, was upon me. Eh? There's a verse, Ezra 8 and 18, and by the good hand of our God. Oh, my friend, we need to pray for Zion that will continue, even although we don't have a pastor, that the good hand of God will be upon us. And if the good hand of God will be upon us, God will use us, and God will bless us, and God will advance us. And it's just to pray personally for each of us to pray that the hand of the Lord will be upon you as an individual and myself as an individual. And when that happens, my friend, sometimes, as I say, we, we think of Joseph. That Joseph was uh, undoubtedly the hand of God was upon him. And where he went, he found favour uh, with God and favour with men, whether it be in the house of Potiphar, whether it be in, in the jail. In a beautiful verse, isn't there? I think it's uh, over in Luke's got the... Uh, very ultimate of this, I think it's in Luke chapter 2, uh, about Christ and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, was in the deserts. Uh, I beg your pardon, that's chapter. What, chapter 2, the very final verse, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. Now how did, he, how did Christ do that? Well, he had to study, my friend. He studied as a, as a Jewish boy. Uh, and it's good to speak to even young people or quite young people. My friend, how much do you devote yourself to the word of God? Word of God, when my mother, if she was alive today and you'd ask her, uh, what do you remember of Jack as a as a teenager, she would, she would tell you times I used to sit in bed, bedroom and study the word of God, study and study uh, uh, as a child. That's why my, my grandmother, uh, she used to say, when Jack's birthday comes on, I just buy him a Christian book because Jack will be happy with a Christian book. <laughs> Any Christian book uh, and as I just a young teenager, I was studying Calvin's Institutes. I used to sit and study Calvin's Institutes uh, just as a young teenager. And I poured myself into the word of God. Uh, and that's, that's my friend. Make sure you do that more than anything. You know, there's a beautiful thing to, do you know the reason why I turned over to Nehemiah? Chapter eight, a uh, chapter eight, uh, that particular uh, chapter eight and verse five. This is Nehemiah now. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up and blessed the Lord, uh, the great God. And all the people answered, I mean, that's lovely. I just read it, listening to a preacher recently uh, on the uh, I was reading a book or, 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 or on the uh, YouTube, and he was saying he finds as a minister when even when he's praying, uh, he likes to hear the congregation say "Amen." He just knows then that they're one with him, uh, in, in mind and in spirit and in heart, uh, and uh, it's good 
to say amen even at the end of other people's prayers uh, you may like to always say amen maybe there was a day and going back to the big church and thankfully god willing we'll be back there there was a day when you used to shout yourself amen amen and hallelujah these days are gone what are you when was the last time you felt like shouting, Amen, Hallelujah? Uh, whether during a sermon or at the end of a sermon or even during the worship, uh, Amen, Hallelujah, praise God. Uh, I've got my flag just lying there, just in case I feel like flying it, you know. Just to, 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 to I've got it lying in front of me here. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, my friend, that's beautiful. What, what, why did I turn to Nehemiah chapter 8? Because Ezra eventually saw a, a national reformation. Do you know what that shows me, my friend? I believe that if we have a revival, spiritual revival, which we're praying for, which, of course, the greatest revivals were always the revivals where the word of God was central, right? The greatest revivals were the revivals where so when you have a revival and the center of the center of the revival is the preaching of the word. Do you know what it will bring about? Renewal for the nation. That's the way to the renewal. Oh, my friend, I'm not saying for a moment that we shouldn't try to have a campaign for laws and thank God for thank God for people who campaign for changes, Wilberforce. Uh, thank God for people like that who <clears throat> campaigned in Parliament to change laws. Yes, there's a place for that. Thank God for <clears throat> one of General Bush's son, Ronald Booth. He was very much involved. Uh, he 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 wasn't an MP, but he lobbied Parliament a lot with I think a few MPs for what to do what well. If you go back to the time of Victoria, what was the age of sexual consent? Twelve. Uh, right, shock there. Twelve. And through Bramwell Booth and others, they managed to get it up to fourteen. Now, there's a place, thank God for that, there's a place for that type of activity. Uh, by all means, I'm talking about something, my friend, that will change the nation. It's change the nation inwardly. Change the nation inwardly. And I do believe, my friend, I do believe that as we pray, that, that's why this has happened locally, happened in places like like uh, Kosaith, my friend, happened happened there. Uh, when there was revival, there was it was it wasn't just that there was a lot of people converted, but even then, Christianity became contagious. Uh, if you ever have a chance, uh, once or twice over here, I've listened to Joe Beakey when he's been over in Scotland preaching. And he's worth listening to, and he's got a little book called uh, Contagious Christianity. Uh, Contagious, we want that, don't we? Contagious Christianity. No, that's it, my friend. That, that, that is it. And uh, when the word of God is central, then holiness is central in the Christian church. And then, as I say, there can be quite a, quite a, a, a renewal right across the nation and it's happened before and let's trust it will happen again uh, uh, and I'm not talking about a uh, legal holiness you might I don't know if you ever maybe you're reading history or some churches near yeah uh, this church is a holiness church that church is a holiness church churches that cause call themselves holiness churches that all came out of over a hundred years ago, particularly the Azusa Street Revival over in America. And there was churches that came out of that, Church of the Nazarene, uh, 
others to other uh, Pentecostal churches. And the Pentecostal churches, even to this day, have a habit of calling themselves holiness churches. Now, now my friend, they want to call themselves holiness churches, but every church should be holy. And I'm not talking about a legal holiness. Something I noticed just, something I noticed recently, in, uh, uh, I was listening on uh, Sunday night there to a Christian family, Collinworth, this Collinworth family. They're beautiful Christians, musicians and singers. And I didn't myself notice that nearly the whole lot of them were married, but not one of them had a, a wedding ring on. Uh, not one of them, the father, the mother, two married daughters and a married son. None had a single ring on it. So I went on to the internet to have a look at this, the Collinworth family, and I think they belong to the church in Nazarene, and it's one of the rules over there. You don't wear rings. Some of the churches allow you to wear, say, a, a wedding ring, as I have here, but certainly not this on the other hand. That's my father's one. Uh, 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 and no jewellery, no jewellery as well. Well, uh, I know where they're coming from. No, I, 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 I'm not going to condemn them if they want, don't want to wear rings and don't want to wear jewelry. That's fine, uh, but it's, it's got to be deeper than that too. Deeper than that too. Just for a remainder of the time, because we've been looking at the centrality uh, of the Word of God. Uh, let's just look very, very quickly at four things: the development of the word. We'll, we'll look at that for the remainder of the time. John 17 and 17. Development of the word of God. John 17 and 17. And verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Why do you say the development of the word? Because my friend that text teaches us not only is the word of God the means of our sanctification and our holiness, but there's a spiritual development there because you'll notice Christ is praying to his Father. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You see, I've been encouraging mention about the importance of studying the scriptures, of course. But you can study the scriptures, my friend, and not get beyond beyond the uh, the, the 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 pastor used to say, ink on India paper. <clears throat> That's why it's a spiritual operation, it's a spiritual development. It's something that comes from the Father through the Holy Spirit. And so think of uh, Acts, I think it's Acts 17, Paul's uh, preaching in, in the house of uh, a, a, a woman, her name's just uh, Lydia, Lydia. Uh, and he's preaching the word of God. Now Lydia with her intellect is obviously taking in the word of God. But that didn't save her. It says the Lord opened her heart. And it's the same, my friend. We've just got to keep praying that the Lord will open our hearts eh, more and more. Look over at Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 and 25. Ephesians 5 and 25. Ephesians 5 and 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, so the washing of the word, see the centrality of the word, that he may present it to himself, a glorious church. And then, my, my friend, the second thing, just to give the word of God, is the discovery of the word. Uh, uh, and the beautiful thing about the Reformation was the word of God was discovered there. You see, back in the fourth century, the Pope asked a man, a scholar, no doubt, Jerome, but he take the Old and New Testaments 
and translate them into Latin. And he did. And for Western Europe, for a thousand years from fourth century to the 14th century in Western Europe, the only Bible was in Latin. Not everybody could speak Latin for obvious reasons. It was only students at university. And then the Reformation, my friend, uh, the word of God was discovered and came, became central. That's why a few years ago, I and myself, we flew over to Berlin and then from Berlin to uh, Berlin to Wittenworth to celebrate the, the Reformation. And the beautiful thing was, although Martin Luther was involved, the, the exhibition was fantastic in Wittenberg. But the emphasis was never on Martin Luther. The whole of that town, every shop, every rest, every everything you saw was all to do with the, the Bible being translated into German. In other words, the word of God being discovered. It was John Calvin that said that when he was converted and he started to read the word of God, he said, oh, he said, I was, the, the, my greatest discovery was the majesty of God and the supremacy of God in all things. Because what you must remember is, my friend, up until the Reformation, the only supremacy that people knew was the supremacy of, of Pope, not the supremacy of God. Yeah. Now this brings us thirdly to the devotion to the word. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 97. Eh? Oh, how love I thy law it is my meditation all the day. My friend, how do you feel about the word of God? I'm not, I'm not asking you to worship a book. I'm, I'm not asking you to get down on your knees and worship a book. No. But eh, how... How do you, much do you love the word of God? Hmm? Now this illustration I'm going to use, it's not my own. I got it off, you say, Jack, what time do you have to read the Bible, all this television that you're watching? Uh, on YouTube, I got this from an American uh, pastor. You'll notice it doesn't say how, see, take away the O. How love I thy law, or how do I love thy law? Now, the psalmist could have said that. How, eh, how I love thy law. But you'll notice it's a mark of exclamation. Oh, oh, how I love thy law. It's a mark of explanation. It's a, you have it through the Bible. Uh, we have it in First John 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon him. Now, as I say, this is not my illustration, but I'll try and illustrate it. What the uh, minister happened to say was, if he gets up to his wife and says, uh, I love you, uh, and even takes, his, takes her in his arms, he says, I love you. Well, she will know, she will take from him. Uh, that he loves her. But he said, and, and this is what, uh, just supposing, I mean, if I got to Irene there and say, I love you, I, well, I take her in my arms as I frequently do, well, that's, she'll know I love her. But if I go up to Irene and say, oh, Irene, I use this ex explanation, exclam exclamation, oh, I love you, Irene, I take her in my arms. That's how you should feel about the word of God. Eh? That's how you should feel about the word of God. See, why should I feel like that? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. I'm going to tell you something. I have seen and I know couples, married couples who are not Christians, who don't share the love of Christ, because that can only be shared by the Holy Ghost. The sheer natural law. I know Christians, my, I, I know couples who are not Christians who, in fact, 
love each love each other with natural love than some Christian couples do. You know what? You think of that for a moment. Husbands love your wives. I'm not wanting to embarrass any anyone. I'm not going to embarrass anyone, but uh, Paul said a lovely thing about uh, his wife this morning on the chat. Husbands love your love your Scott, I should say. I can mix up there, not Paul Scott. So, hey, what, I should, what I'm saying is this, my friend, husbands, love your wives. Do you know, my love for my wife is to be a reflection of Christ's love for her and for myself and for her. And how many Christian couples are not saying it doesn't happen, I'm not saying that. Over the years, I've seen so many couples, my friend, claiming married couples and their wife to say she's been shortchanged of, of the love of Christ uh, uh, is an understatement. No, my friend, if you're, uh, uh, let me just say too, uh, if you're in a, a marriage and you're only one Christian in the marriage, right, but some of us in the church have, you're only the one Christian in the mind. Can you share the love of Christ? I think you can. But one thing you can't have is you can share the love of Christ, but you'll not, uh, how can I put it, there's nothing within your unconverted partner that will bring it back to you. In other words, bring it back to you in a spiritual way. But you can still show the love of Christ to them. Uh, and because Paul talks about, I'll be in First Corinthians seven. Paul talks about in First Corinthians seven that uh, unconverted uh, wives can win their uncon uh, converted wives can win their unconverted husbands. So there's that, my friend. But uh, no, that's it. That's it, my friend. And sometimes, as you sometimes couples as get older, they get stoical and oh, uh, dance together. Never a thousand years, no, my friend. And that brings us to something that lastly Ezra had through the word of God himself. What is it? What she gets through the word of God? Direction, Proverbs, chapter three. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6. In fact, there's a verse, uh, uh, it's just a verse, it's not my, one of my verses, but look at verse 4 of Proverbs 3. So shall thou find favour and good understanding in the sight of God and man. That's by uh, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not unto thine own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him, he shall direct thy paths. So uh, that's that's beautiful, my friend. You get direction when you trust the word of God when you're central in your life. Psalm 19 is our final scripture. Psalm 19. Uh, Psalm A. Uh, Psalm 19, if I can just get that for you. Psalm 19, verses 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. Statues of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Uh, and verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, they than much fine gold, sweeter also than high. My friend, put your put the word of God at the center of, of, of your of your life. Yeah, at the center uh, of your life. There was a verse that I was a verse that I was looking for in uh, it's a verse I was wanting to share, but I don't see no, I don't see this verse I'm looking for. So I know there's been a lot of scripture today, and, and, and I've, I've asked you to look up quite a lot of scripture. But it's just to show you, my friend, in the life of Ezra himself. Here was a man who ended up with 
ended up with a, a national reformation that might not have lasted too long, but nevertheless, he did. And we've been just looking at over the past few weeks uh, as we've been studying in a uh, priesthood. Uh, that's four sermons we've looked at. So we'll leave it there today. And I trust we maybe come back to, I, I'm not just positive, we should maybe come back to the to, uh, priesthood. So we'll leave it there.